Good evening from Jerusalem. Good afternoon in North America. Um, I'll deal with just a few issues that the coronavirus pandemic has created. Uh, you can find, oops. You can find more about these topics in the book that uh, Tamar mentioned, The Coronavirus Pandemic, Historical, Medical, and Halachic Perspectives. And the only thing missing in this book are the vaccines and what they represent, which I'll present here in my talk. But the book appeared just before the vaccines were approved, so it wasn't included in the book. Uh, as you can see, the outer cover, the book on one side is in English, on the other side in Hebrew. They are the same, just translations. And the uh, Hebrew speakers can look at the Hebrew side and English speakers at the English side. Before going into the issues, let's just sum up the, the terrible year that we experienced uh, since February 2020 till today. So from a physical health point of view, there is a significant mortality and morbidity due to uh, this up to now unknown virus. And even after a year, we still are surprised what this virus can do. So in Israel, the numbers are even now changing. Uh, the mortality rate of uh, has already crossed the 6,000 unfortunate people who died. And the ill people are 810,000 so far. In the USA, 520,000 people died and 29 million people suffered from uh, health problems due to the virus. And if we look at the world, 2.6 million people died and 117 million people have been sick, some are still very sick, and that covers over 200 countries and territories. So it's really a very serious pandemic, which we haven't experienced for at least 100 years, which I'll speak about in a minute. But besides the physical health that is affected by this virus, there are other significant problems that it caused due to the pandemic involving the entire human race. So there are emotional health problems, people who are quarantined, who are in lockdowns, who cannot meet families, even when they are sick, they can't get visitors. This creates significant emotional problems and borderline people, it even turns into psychiatric uh, diseases. We all know about the economic effect of the pandemic. People are out of jobs. People have lost their livelihoods, their businesses, and it's really a very, very difficult economical situation. Also, from an educational point of view, schools have been closed totally or open periodically. Alternative methods of education did not uh, show that they are effective enough. And probably this year is sort of a lost year for many children and students. And obviously the social dynamics and the social aspects of not being able to meet, to go out to restaurants, to go to schools, to go to uh, universities, etc. These social meetings has obviously uh, caused detrimental effects. So it's really one of the worst pandemics of uh, the human race. Now, um, one of the issues, sorry, one of the issues that at the beginning and occasionally even later so, uh, was the question whether there is a halachic, a moral, or even in some places a legal obligation to follow what the authorities are directing, even though it causes a lot of discomfort and a lot of problems. So it is 
a clear halachic obligation to follow and conduct ourselves in accordance with the directives of the medical authorities and the medical uh, uh, directives that the government issues based on the medical knowledge of the time and place. At certain times, uh, one way was the right way according to the experts and other times it was different, but one is obligated to follow it. And that is driven from a whole host of halachic uh, directives. One is v'nishmartem odan afshotechem, you have to keep yourself well and healthy. That is a positive biblical obligation to do what is best to keep ourselves healthy and well. Pikuach nefesh, we know if it is a danger to life, this overrides all other mitzvot, all other commandments, even to the degree that one is allowed to eat on Yom Kippur and to desecrate Shabbat in order to save life. So that is something that life should be preserved by all means. And not only personally should uh, everyone heed and, and conduct himself according to the uh, rules, the, the medical rules, but even a greater obligation is to avoid the infecting of others, the causing of damage to others. There is a concept of a rodef, of someone who is running after someone else and wants to kill him. That is a serious violation in halacha. And if someone is causing deaths or, or damage to others, this is even worse than causing the same problem to oneself. So there is a whole host of halachic directives that one should uh, keep whatever is the right way to be healthy and well. Interestingly, that in the uh, beginning of the 19th century already, one of the greatest halachic authorities in, in the past uh, centuries, and at that time the leading authority, Rabbi Akiva Eger, he lived during the second cholera pandemic. There were seven uh, cholera pandemics during the 19th and early 20th centuries. And he uh, was the leader during the second one. And he wrote a few letters, which are halachic rulings to everyone in the area where the cholera pandemic uh, was active. And some of them are so similar to our situation that we can learn a lot from what he wrote. So for instance, what you see here on the slide, he writes, I have constantly warned that one's eating and drinking should follow the doctor's prescription and they should avoid medically forbidden foods as if they are halachically forbidden foods. In other words, if doctors, if the experts say that you have to eat certain foods or drink cer certain beverages in order to keep your health. It is as if I, I'm telling you that you have to eat kosher food. And if they say you don't have to eat certain foods, it's as if I'm telling you not to eat pig or other forbidden halachically foods. That's how far he went. And one should not violate doctor's orders, even at that. He, goes even further to say one who violates a doctor's orders is considered to have gravely sinned to God and their sin will be too much to bear. In other words, it is a halachic biblical obligation to do what experts are telling you to do because you have to keep your health in order. So in our uh, situation, it became apparent that Orthodox Jewish population, both in Israel and the United States, in England and in other countries, experienced a disproportionate amount of infection in the community in the, in the initial waves of this pandemic. And therefore, most and the highest rabbinic authorities publicized the necessity to follow all requirements of medical experts and health authorities. Unfortunately, there were a few 
rabbis or people who think they are of the level of rabbis that violated officially uh, the uh, orders of the experts and unfortunately paid a very high price. As you can see from what I am summarizing here, that is a halachic uh, prohibition to act in such a way and it is a halachic obligation to do what authorities say that it is the right way to behave. So that is just a general uh, uh, outlook on the halachic perspective on how to behave during such a pandemic. I'll deal with a few issues, as I said uh, at the beginning, I, it's impossible to cover all the issues and, and questions that came up, but I'll deal with a few of them. And I'll, tr I'll start with questions of triage in treating coronavirus patients during severe shortage of life-saving measures. Fortunately, Israel did not reach such a stage at any level of the pandemic, although in the initial stages with, with the first wave and the second one, there was a fear that indeed we will run into a situation that we will have to triage, but fortunately, and Baruch Hashem, we didn't come to it. But there were countries where it happened and they had to make triage decisions, such as in Italy, in Spain, some places in the United States. And as uh, you will see, their decisions were not according to halachic ethics in certain aspects. So I'm going to present to you how halacha would have treated it if this would have happened. Anyway, it is always a tragic choice of life and death, because if there is a shortage and there are two people who are in need of a life-saving measure and there's only one such measure to save only one person, whatever decision will take, one will live and the other one will die. And that is really a very tragic decision, both on the physician at at the end point where he has to make the decision and on those who are giving the guidelines on how to do it. So what are we talking about? Some of the life-saving measures include ICU beds, ventilators, ECMO machines, medications, PPEs, and medical personnel, including physicians, nurses, technicians, and so on. In other words, these are measures that if there are more patients than the measures are available, some of them will not receive it and therefore die. And that is really, as I said, a tragic choice. Now, a situation <clears throat> where triage decision has to be taken is usually some sudden tragedy which is unanticipated causing mass casualties and within a very short period of time, and at the same time, there is not enough ability to fully treat all of them, either because of limited personnel or because of limitation in equipment. So in principle, <clears throat> triage decisions have to be taken, not only in this pandemic, but it happens in many other disasters. It can happen with accidents, especially train or airplane accidents where there are many, many casualties and not enough personnel and equipment to treat all of them. Natural disasters such as earthquakes, floods, tsunamis, and so on. <clears throat> Obviously in wartime, when a battalion is going into war and there's only one physician accompanying them and there are several injured soldiers, a triage decision has to be made. It can happen also in industrial disasters such as fires, explosions, and so on. And it happens and happened throughout human history in pandemics. It happened with the pestilence pandemic, cholera, which I mentioned, influenza, Ebola, AIDS, and now we are facing the corona pandemic. And in those situations, the mass casualty may happen with 
limited measures to save. So what are some of the sources, the halachic sources that we can perhaps derive answers on how to deal with this situation? So there's a famous passage in Bava Metzia. If two people were walking on a desolate path and there was a jug of water in the possession of one of them, and if both drink from the jug, both will die. But if only one of them drinks, he will reach a settled area. So the question is, what is the halachic moral obligation of the person who has the water and can save himself, but then his fellow, who, fellow man who is walking with him will die? So Ben Petora taught, it is preferable that both of them drink and die and let neither one of them see the death of the other. So this obligation is to share the water with the other one, even on the expense and account that he will not survive by doing so. But this was changed by Rabbi Akiva, who taught that the verse and your brother shall live with you indicates that your life takes precedence over the life of others. So that if you have the water and you can save yourself, you take precedence over your fellow men. There is a halachic debate amongst the later uh, poskim about the opinion of Rabbi Akiva, whether he means that the one who possesses the water is obligated to save himself, otherwise he is doing an act which looks like committing suicide, or he is allowed to drink his water, but if he wants to do more than the, the law requires and be a pious person, he still can share it with his fellow men. But be it as it may, this is actually irrelevant to modern situations, because in this case, the two people are the ones that one of them owns the measure that will save life. So he is within the life saving situation that needs the, the, the measure that will save his own life. That almost never happens in modern situations because always the life-saving measure belongs to a third party, belongs to the country, belongs to the hospital, belongs to the army or wh wherever we are. And the people who are in need of these measures, neither of them possesses the life-saving measure. And therefore the question is, whom should the one who has the measure, but in a limited uh, fashion, give it to? And that can't be derived from this source. Another source are two Mishnayot in Horayot, which seem seemingly are giving an order of triage who to save first in a situation where there's not sufficient measures to save life. So in one Mishnah, it says a man precedes a woman. And in a second Mishnah, it says that a Kohen precedes a Levi, a Levi precedes an Israeli, and so on. So it seems like there is a hierarchy of importance of people according to the number of mitzvot that they are obligated to observe. So the more mitzvot they are obligated to preserve, they take precedence over those who are required to preserve less mitzvot. But this has been ruled that it is not a, a measure that we can use practically. It's impossible, for instance, to, to ask 20 people who are in need of one respirator, who of you is a Kohen, who is a Levi, and so on. This obviously is not something that can be used uh, actually in situations of, uh, of uh, a lot of people who are in need. And therefore the leading uh, post scheme of our generation of Moshe Feinstein in his response, I got Moshe and Rabbi Shlomo Zalman Oyerbach in his response, I mean Shlomo, although they didn't discuss it amongst themselves, they reached the same conclusion that from practical halacha, it is not to be followed the way the Mishnah is stating it. 
So we are left actually without a, a way to triage people. What do we do with it? So the answer is that we do use only one criterion for triage, and that is the medical factor. In other words, if we have five people who are in need of a respirator and we have only two respirators, we will give the respirators to those whose medical condition requires the respirator, but they have the greatest chances to survive if we give them the respirator. So if from a medical point of view, a seemingly healthy person who contracted the virus and has now severe pneumonia due to the virus and he needs a respirator, his chances to survive are much greater than someone who has a lot of background diseases, who has cancer, who has a heart failure, who has a liver failure, that even if we'll put him on the respirator, his chances to survive are much slimmer than the other one. And therefore, the triage will be followed according to the medical criteria, who has the greatest chances to make it when we give them the uh, limited resource that can save their life. Halachically, age per se is not an accepted factor, so that if a 70-year-old old woman comes in and she has only pneumonia, otherwise she is a healthy woman, and a 20-year-old man comes in and he also has only a medical, or only a pneumonia and not other risk factors, then the fact that he's younger is irrelevant halachically to give him priority. But usually with advanced age, there are more problems, uh, medical problems, and therefore sometimes the age is part of the whole scenario of what the person is suffering from. And then it is not because of his age, but it is because of his risk factors from a medical point of view. The same holds true for physical or mental disability that in and of itself, they are not considered as a reason not to uh, afford them the limited resources to save their lives just because they are amputees or they are mentally uh, slower than others. These by themselves are not reasons to triage them out. Now, in practice, when we are talking about the time to make triage decisions, we look into three different stages of a pandemic. The first is during normal times and during emergencies when there are sufficient life-saving resources and personnel. So in principle, as we will see in a minute, this is not a situation where we should triage. We should give equal chances to everyone, even those who have less chances to survive. The second stage is during an emergency where there are insufficient life-saving resources, but prior to initiating interventions, meaning that 20 people come in front of us to the emergency room or to the ICU, we didn't start yet treatment on any of them, and we have only resources for five of them. So we have to triage those five in a way that halacha and ethics would allow to do. And the third level is during an emergency when there are insufficient life-saving resources, but once interventions have been initiated, so that we have already five people in the ICU occupying ICU beds and on ventilators, and there are no more ICU beds and no more ventilators. And now comes another person whose chances are perhaps greater than one or two of those who are already treated. We have to find a way to triage to give the chance to the one that has greater uh, success rate to survive. So during the first stage, it is an obligation upon the government to do whatever is needed to prepare all the necessary 
means in order to avoid the stage that there won't be sufficient life-saving measures. And indeed, in Israel at least, during the first wave, Israel bought hundreds of respirators and also started to produce here in Israel respirators so that there was enough respirators for everyone in, in this situation. And also hospitals built uh, uh, temporary ICUs for corona, coronavirus patients with an abundance of place so that there was no lack of ICU beds because the ICU beds, the, the stable one, the, the ones that we have certainly were not sufficient for the amount of people who needed it. Also personnel was uh, increased by all kinds of ways during the time when there was still a possibility to prepare for the eventuality that there won't be enough uh, life-saving measures. Also, it is an obligation on every citizen to follow in this uh, premature uh, stage where there's still enough uh, life-saving measures, follow what the government guidelines are because it is the responsibility of every citizen to save himself so that he will not be the one that will create a shortage when he will become sick. So besides the obligation to keep healthy for himself, there is an obligation to keep healthy in order not to create a situation of shortage of resources, which will uh, necessitate a triage decision. So that is in the first stage. In the second stage, actually, we believe that the value of, of life of each and everyone is both of a supreme value and of equal value so that everyone should have the chance to save his life. However, unfortunately, when we reach a situation where there are not enough resources of life-saving uh, measures, we must do something to make justice, even though the life, the value of life is of supreme value, and we want it to be equal to everyone, but we can't do it. And therefore comes in the prioritization determined only by medical criteria, which is who is in immediate need for intensive care or respirator, and who has the greater chance to benefit from the intensive care or from the ventilator. This is how we triage uh, people when we don't have enough resources. Now, stage number three, when we already started treating and now one or two of those who we started treating in an ICU on a ventilator deteriorates and now his chances become very slim to survive and another person comes in who has a greater chance to survive there are things that we are allowed to do as a triage decision, and there are things which we are not allowed to do. We are not allowed to kill the person whose uh, chances became now low, who deteriorated. Nevertheless, he's still alive, and we can't kill him in order to free his bed and respirator for someone else. That is accepted by everyone that the, you don't just kill him in order to save someone else. Halachically, the equivalent of killing is to withdraw him from the respirator. If we disconnect him from a respirator, that halachically is an act of killing, which we are not allowed to do, even though his chances now are slim and someone else needs the respirator and has greater chances. But what we can do in this situation is A, move him out of the ICU into a regular floor with the respirator, but not with the intensive care of the ICU, and therefore freeing at least the bed in the ICU for someone who has greater chances to survive. And we are allowed to withhold further treatments if complications 
come on to this one person who, whose chances are now very slim. And by doing so, he will die of his illness sooner than if we will treat him intensively at this final stage of his life. So there are a whole host of medical decisions how to uh, treat this situation. Important is to realize that even if we decide not to treat aggressively and intensively a dying patient in order to uh, free his bed and his ventilator to someone who has greater chances, we should still give him proper palliative care. When we can't cure, at least we should care. And the care has to be to avoid pain, to avoid side effects such as vomiting and depression, to let someone come and visit him that is dear to him so that he will be with him and he will feel better. All these measures have to continue even if we decided that the chances to survive are slim. So this is as far as some brief comments on triage decisions if we need to make them. Now let's turn to the issue of the vaccines. And I want to talk about two aspects. One is the importance of getting vaccinated. And the other one is when there are not enough vaccines, how do we triage in this situation? So without going into the biology and the importance of, of vaccines at large, I think it is very important to realize that vaccination is the most effective method of preventing infectious diseases. We know for a fact that before the vaccine against smallpox was introduced, 300 million people died from smallpox. Since the vaccine came into being, today there are zero cases of deaths from smallpox. It's actually eradicated around the world. Sa similarly, from polio, over 1 billion people died over the years, and after the vaccinations came into being, only a few hundred people die annually, which is a significant reduction in the number of deaths due to this uh, infectious disease. So today we have about 25 different preventable infections, vaccines that are licensed and are uh, given, and they really saved many, many lives of many, many diseases. Now, the benefits of vaccines in general, not, now, I'm not talking now about the uh, corona vaccine, but I'm talking about uh, all the vaccines, that A, it saved the lives of millions and maybe even billions. It also saved fetuses from severe diseases. One example is German measles, which is a mild illness for the pregnant woman, but the fetus, if the virus uh, attacks it, uh, is, uh, the virus causes significant damage to the fetus and the children born have severe defects and disabilities due to this uh, infection. And now that pregnant women are vaccinated against German measles, we almost never see any more fetal uh, uh, German measles uh, rubella uh, syndrome, which was very frequent even in my days as a young physician. The story of measles is something that currently proves the benefits of the vaccine. At some point a few years ago, certain groups decided <clears throat> against measles because there was a story that it might cause autism, which was proven to be what we call today fake news, even though it was published in a reputable uh, medical journal, which retracted it when it was uh, shown that it was a fake uh, study. But some people believed in the study and therefore they stopped vaccinating their children against measles and several babies died 
although no baby is dying nowadays for measles if he is vaccinated. So certainly there is a tremendous and proven benefit to vaccinations. There is some harm to the vaccines. There might be mild side effects, but usually and almost never do we have serious side effects, certainly not in the numbers of the side effects of the disease itself. <clears throat> so therefore, uh, since uh, most professional regulatory bodies and most outstanding experts approved vaccines, these vaccines are a must to be taken in order to save again your own life and prevent you infect others and cause them death. And therefore, all these vaccines are of tremendous importance. Interestingly, that when uh, the smallpox vaccine was created, the leading rabbi at the time was Rabbi Israel Lifshitz, who wrote the famous interpretation on the Mishnah called Tiferet Israel, And he describes the, the initial invention of the smallpox vaccine. And in his days, there was a risk of even mortality due to the vaccine itself, but certainly without the vaccine, the mortality rate was terrible. And therefore he ruled halachically that one should take a small and remote risk in order to save himself from a certain and great risk. And that was the view of most of the poskim throughout the generations. And now if we turn to the uh, COVID-19 vaccine, which is a relatively a new uh, type of vaccine using a messenger RNA, time doesn't permit me to go into a scientific explanation how it works, but it has been proven in the experiments of Pfizer and Moderna as being effective up to 95% and being safe with very little side effects which were temporary and not serious. Now we know, certainly from Israel, that over 5 million people have been vaccinated at least with one uh, dose and close to 3 million people already with two doses. And as of February, a month and a half ago, around the globe, 123 million doses of this vaccine have been administrated. And we see the effectiveness even greater than what the experiments of Pfizer and Moderna proved. And the safety is absolutely a fact that we can see that no serious side effects occurred during the millions who were vaccinated and saved. There are now the, in Israel, the sick people who are hospitalized, over 95% of them are people who have not been vaccinated or at least not fully vaccinated. In other words, those who are fully vaccinated don't get to a serious disease and certainly not to mortality and only very, very few of them for reasons that we still don't know, uh, contract a more serious disease. Also amongst pregnant women, all those who suffered from a serious disease during their pregnancy necess necessitating uh, to perform C-section at a premature stage in order to save the life of the fetus and the mother, all of them are and were women who were not vaccinated. None of a pregnant woman who has been vaccinated got to become seriously ill and certainly didn't need to have a premature delivery. So it is effective and safe and therefore it saves the uh, situation because during the year up to the invention of the vaccines, all measures that all governments throughout the world took were not 
effective in order to stop the uh, pandemic. Neither closures, no quarantines, no close-ups, all these turned out to be of a very relative uh, effectiveness. And only since the uh, vaccines, we are now in Israel going freer and freer. Schools are opening, uh, canyons are opening, restaurants are opening, and life is returning without side effects due to the fact that so many people are already vaccinated. There were all kinds of problems with it. I don't want to go into it uh, uh, too much. All of them are, have been treated correctly. And I think that all the uh, reservations uh, can be put aside. And if time will permit later, we can uh, go over some of them. So that is as far as uh, the vaccines are concerned. Now, from a halachic point of view, based on the facts that I just mentioned, there is a halachic obligation to be vaccinated with the approved vaccines, both for the sake of the person to keep healthy and for the sake of others to prevent them from being infected by unvaccinated uh, people. And therefore, halachically, it uh, must be done the way we say. There is an interesting question, what do you do from a societal halachic point of view to those people who in principle refuse to be vaccinated? Can you force them to be vaccinated? Can you punish them for not being vaccinated? Can you sue them for infecting others if you can prove that it came from them? Can you deny certain benefits like going into a restaurant or into a shul? where they might endanger others? Can you deny their employment, especially people who work with people such as teachers, healthcare providers, those people who in principle don't want to be vaccinated may infect others who are vaccinated, but some of them are not fully vaccinated or have other reasons uh, that it's not uh, effective enough. And therefore uh, the unvaccinated person may be liable of causing damage. So these are questions that have been dealt uh, so far uh, in, in the literature. Now, the question of triage. Here, the triage is different than the triage that I spoke earlier concerning life-saving measures. There, the situation was that at the moment, if I don't treat a person who is in need of an ICU bed and of a ventilator, he will die. He can't wait. And therefore, the triage is life or death. There's no uh, two ways about it. Whereas with the vaccines, the assumption is that at some point, there will be enough vaccines to vaccinate everyone. But at a certain point in time, there are only limited numbers of vaccines that can be uh, injected. And therefore we need to triage temporarily who will get first the vaccination and who will get it later. But at the end point, in this case, it is assumed that everyone can be vaccinated. And here therefore, the reason to triage or the justification for triage is a little different than the life-saving triage. And therefore the decision in Israel and in many other countries was that healthcare providers should be the first to be vaccinated because they are A, more susceptible to becoming infected because they treat uh, infected uh, patients. And also they are needed to save others. And if they become sick or if they die, there'll be a shortage of healthcare providers. The second in line are those who are older than 60 years of age, and especially those who have significant underlying diseases, because statistically, this is the most uh, uh, severely ill group that if they contract the virus, their chances to be very sick and even die are the highest. Third in line are people 
who are in contact with others, as I mentioned, uh, teachers, uh, policemen, essential businesses, these people should be uh, vaccinated third in the hierarchy. And after we covered all these higher risk uh, groups, we can uh, vaccinate all the rest. Now let me conclude with just a few halachic issues that are purely halachic and not uh, only ethical uh, from a medical point of view. So one of the issues was how to do a Brit Milah during the pandemic. So to start with, if the baby and the mother and obviously the moel and everyone around is healthy and wasn't in contact with an infected individual, the Brit Milah should be done on the eighth day the same way as no uh, pandemic. The fact that out there there is a pandemic is not relevant for the specific baby to be uh, circumcised on the eighth day. In order to keep everyone well, the moel is required to observe himself all the regulations of the Ministry of Health so that he should be careful about cleanliness, washing his hands, uh, sterilizing his utensils, uh, cover his uh, mouth and, and nose with a mask, and if he can use a disposable apron, that is uh, even better. He also has to ensure that everyone around is following the rules and regulations. If it's done in a close room, there should be very few people. The people should all uh, follow the distances and the, and the masks so that there will be no uh, cross infection. Now that we have vaccines, every moil should be vaccinated or if he refuses, at least being tested negative within 24 hours before the bris. Otherwise, he may infect others, not so much the baby, because babies in this age are rarely infected. And if infected, they rarely get seriously ill, but he may infect uh, others who are with him. It is also uh, important to understand that many of the mothers during labor or delivery or the first days before the breed are either uh, diagnosed with coronavirus or were in contact with the coronavirus uh, person or uh, have symptoms even though they weren't yet diagnosed. All this has to be taken into account whether to do the bris on time or not. And our recommendation is that in such cases, the baby itself should be tested for coronavirus 24 hours prior to the breed. And if it tests negative and he is asymptomatic, the breed can be done on time, even though he was in touch with his mother who may have been uh, diagnosed with coronavirus or suspected of being ill with that and therefore uh, the, he is healthy at the time that the bris is performed. So these are some rules regarding Brit Milah. We are now approaching uh, Pesach and if hopefully uh, we will not be in quarantine and not have to be alone with a very small uh, number of uh, relatives, then obviously all what I'm going to say is irrelevant, but in places and countries in areas where there's still a, a pandemic which requires quarantine and people cannot go out, there are a few questions on how to uh, act on Pesach. So for instance, as we all know, the firstborn uh, is required to fast on the day before Pesach. This year, the day before Pesach is Shabbat, and on Shabbat, people are not allowed to fast, certainly for not for such a custom, which is not something uh, biblically obligated. So the question is, when is the firstborn obligated to fast? 
So there are three options. One is on Friday, the day before, the day before Pesach, because that is Shabbat, or even on Thursday, or altogether not to fast, because if he can't fast on the day prior to Pesach, then he is exempt from fasting altogether. The Shulchan Aruch, the Mechaber uh, rules that it's either on Thursday or not at all. The Remo says that the custom amongst the Ashkenazim is that the time is on Thursday. So this year on Thursday, the firstborn has to fast, but as we all know, the custom has developed that the firstborn are participating in a seum, in a finishing of a Talmudic tractate. Preferably he himself should, should do it, and then it is a seudat mitzvah, and he's from now on exempt from fasting on. And if he can't finish a tractate himself, he can participate with others who do so, usually the rabbi of the shul or, or some other member. But if he can't go to shul and he can't participate with others, then there is a list of what he can do, which is regarded as a seal, so that he can learn a, an order of Mishnah or even a tractate of Mishnah. If he can't uh, learn a whole tractate of the Talmud, he can even study a book of Nevi'im. And in this way, he can be exempt from a Excuse me. He can be exempt from fasting. Also, he can participate via phone or Zoom with someone who is doing the seum of a Talmudic tractate if he can't do it on his own. Selling chomets, again, the custom is to come to shul and go to the rabbi who has a contract that you sell him you make him a shaliach, you allow him to sell for you all the chomets that you own to a non-Jew. But if you can't come to shul to sign it, you can do it either by fax or by email, or even by a website of such rabbis who sell chomets for people. The Seder is somewhat problematic for people who are all together alone. It is a very uh, difficult time to be alone during the Seder, but sometimes uh, it is impossible to allow, especially elderly people, to host or to go to other people for fear that they'll become sick. There's no way, halachically, to allow a technological way that he can participate with others and therefore unfortunately he will have to conduct the seder by himself. Interestingly some of the coronavirus patients lose their taste and as if they are taste if they can't taste the question is how are they fulfilling the mitzvah of eating matzah on, in Leila Seder. Can they eat the matzah despite the fact that they don't taste it and fulfill the mitzvah? And the answer is yes, because the matzah, we have to swallow it even if we don't feel the taste. That is not the case to fulfill the mitzvah of maror, where it is not sufficient to swallow the maror, you have to feel the bitterness of the maror, and that is the whole idea of the maror, and if you don't have a, a tasting buds, then you won't feel the bitterness, then you can't recite the blessing when you eat maror. So these are some of the issues. I think time is uh, up already. There are many other uh, halachic issues that uh, were discussed, uh, that are discussed in, the, in my book that I published, and you can see there all kinds of other issues, and I hope you'll enjoy reading it and learning it. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Professor Steinberg. I, I hope your book won't be relevant for long, but at the moment it seems to, that it's gonna stay with us for a while, so, Let's see if you have a question that came up during your talk. 
So the few questions about um, the AstraZeneca um, vaccine, I think some of our audience is from England and it's not, we don't use this vaccine in Israel, uh, but they would like to know what you have to say about that vaccine, I think. Well, there are different types of vaccines. Uh, there's a Johnson & Johnson and there is a AstraZeneca, there is a Pfizer, the Moderna, there's the Sputnik, and there's a Chinese type of vaccine. You have to get the vaccine that has the highest efficacy and the lowest uh, side effects. We know so far that Pfizer and Moderna seem to be the best. So if they are available and you have a choice, you should take them. But if what is available is a vaccine that is somewhat less effective, then it's better than not taking anything. So therefore, if that is all that you, you can have, then better take it rather than stay unvaccinated and be exposed. Absolutely. Um, Tamar Bernstein would like to know why age is not a criteria. Um, this goes back to the topic of trash. Is not a criteria if younger has potentially more possible possibilities of more mitzvot. Well, there are two answers to it. One is, in principle, every minute of life is precious and counts. We don't know to say if one year of life of one person is more or less important than 70 years of life of someone else. Economically, you can say, yes, the one that has 70 years to, to live, he can produce more, he can be beneficial to society and so on. And the one who has uh, five years to live will produce less, but that is not a halachic criteria. And the value of every year, of every day of life is infinite. We can't say how many years are better than others. That is one aspect. From a practical point of view, how, where do you set the limits? Let's say you get a 30 year old female that comes in with no background diseases and she's healthy, but she needs a ventilator. And next to her comes a 40 year old male who also needs the ventilator. Would you say that the 30, 40 year difference is sufficient to give priority to 30 years over 40. So where do you set the limits? It sounds easier if it's a 20 year old and a 80 year old, then you may make sense that maybe there's there something to, to consider, but it's hard to put the limits to it and it's a true slippery slope. And thirdly, even though it is a young person who theoretically has many years in front of him, and the other one is an elderly gentleman who theoretically has less year to live, we know that young people are engaged in all kinds of uh, dangerous activities, of driving, of going to the army, and they are liable perhaps to die much sooner than the older person who is settled, who is not doing dangerous things, and he may survive the full amount of, of years that are allotted to him. So we can't predict just the fact that now this is younger than this one, that because of it will give priority. So in principle and in practical terms, the number of years left are not a consideration in triage. The consideration mm -hmm. is what are the chances to survive this particular disease? And that is what we do in routine life. And that is what we do in a pandemic. Okay. Um, Yvonne Marco, could you please uh, retype your question? I'm sorry, I couldn't understand it at the moment. Um, let's see if there's anything else we missed here. Um, just a moment. Uh, for all those asking about a recording of the of this session, you will get anyone who signed up here for, will get an email with the link to the to the recording. So that's no problem. Um, there's a question that I'm pretty sure you answered. Rivka is wants to is saying if people are receiving treatment and another patient appears who can benefit from the treatment, can you remove it from the original patient? But I think you actually answered that already and said. 
that we won't be doing that. Um, Leslie wants to know regarding triage, if someone who wears a mask and keeps social distancing have priority over someone who doesn't? Well, so the, the, this is an, uh, a good question and an interesting one. Yeah. Can we give priority over someone who did not follow the rules and therefore became sick, either because he didn't wear a mask or he didn't believe in, in distances or he didn't vaccinate himself and he got very sick. And now comes another one who did everything right and he's also sick and both need the only ventilator left. So in principle, in medicine and in hospitals, we are not judging people because let's say someone is a smoker and he comes in with lung cancer. Would we say we won't treat you because you caused yourself the damage or someone who is a alcoholist and he comes in with a liver disease? Would we punish him and say, we can't treat you because you brought it upon yourself? So we are not judges as physicians. We don't know the circumstances. We can't go into it. Someone else will, will judge the person, will punish him if needed. But at the time that he comes, he's a patient and we disregard the background, both the negative one as the question was, but also the positive one. It can be someone who contributed to society tremendously and someone who is a simple person, we are not prioritizing the one that uh, did a lot of good things. And now his illness is such that he will not survive just because he did some good things over a, a simple person whose life is as valuable, as I said, it's equal and, and infinite of value and therefore will treat it based on medical criteria of survival only. Okay. Um, how are the halachot that you listed administered at the hospital ICU on a daily basis? Well, again, it's a good question because on a daily basis, we triage in ICU as well, because usually in the corona situation, as I said, the government and the hospitals created many temporary ICUs and therefore there were sufficient beds. But in regular days, there are 10, 20 uh, ICU beds. And occasionally there are more patients, who, regular patients, not pandemic patients, who need the ICU and you have to triage. And the triage is based on the same principles. If the chances are great to survive, then we admit him. If the chances are very slim, we might admit him with the condition that if someone who is in greater need of the bed and much greater chances to survive, that we might remove the patient from the ICU into a regular floor, continue treating him, but not so intensively if his chances are slim and someone else is in need of the bed. Okay, I'm gonna take the last question here from Karen. Does the halakha say that people who have chosen not to be vaccinated can be excluded from places of entertainment or work? Yes, so the answer I said was that if someone can do an act that will minimize his damage to others, certainly for himself, but now we're talking about others, if he can do it and for whatever reason he decides not to do it, then we cannot allow him to damage others. So if a person can be vaccinated and then can be safely enter a restaurant or a concert hall or a shul or, or a school, whatever uh, the place he wants to go in, and he decided not to be vaccinated and he poses a danger to the people who are in these places, in the school, in the shul, in the restaurant, then halachically he can be excluded so that he will not cause uh, damage and injury to others. 
Thank you very much, for Professor Steinberg, for giving us a Jewish and a Lachic way to look at these um, issues, which are part of everybody's life today in Israel and abroad. And I'd like to take this opportunity and uh, hope together with everyone that in a year's time, we'll be looking at a different year and different times. So much health to everyone. And Pesach Sameach, everybody. Thank you, Professor Steinberg, and thank you, everyone, for joining us this evening. Thank you very much, and I wish everyone a Pesach Kasher V'Sameach, and please keep well and healthy so that we can meet in other circumstances face-to-face -face and not through a webinar.